Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mr. Toby, and I'm the host of Musical Chairs, presented by the Vermont Symphony Orchestra's Symphony Kids. Today, we are so excited to be at the Birds of Vermont Museum in Huntington, Vermont, for some music and fun. We're here today with Aaron Talmadge, who's the Executive Director of the Birds of Vermont Museum. Thanks, Toby. Thanks for coming out here today. It's been really fun to get to hear the guitar. Normally, we're focused on bird songs, so something to shake it up is nice. Now, Erin, can you tell us more about this amazing museum? The museum has been here for over 30 years, and our tagline is where natural history meets art. Looking around the museum, you can see why we came up with that. The museum has over 500 wood carvings. Almost all are Vermont birds. The idea is that you could come here, learn about the birds, and then head out into your own backyard to see what might be there. Almost all of the birds were made by Bob Spear. He passed away in 2014, so a few of the birds have been made by some other local wood carvers. When you come visit the museum, you can also see Bob's shop and learn about how he made the birds. In addition to the indoor exhibits, we have over 100 acres of trails, and people are welcome to come anytime dawn to dusk to explore the property. Well, thank you so much, Erin, for having us here today. Well, we loved having you here. Thanks for visiting. Since 1987, this unique museum has hosted hundreds of lifelike bird carvings, fascinating exhibits, and educational activities for all ages. The museum is open year-round, but by appointment only at this time of year. Later on, we're going to make a musical instrument together out of some things that you may have lying around. You're going to need a straw, and a pair of scissors. So if you want to pause and go see if you can find those things, now's a great time to go for it. At Musical Chairs, we have been learning about the instruments found in a symphony orchestra. In our past episodes, we've explored the orchestral instruments that make up each of the instrument families. The instruments that we've talked about, such as the violin, the flute, the trumpet, and the timpani, are instruments that you will always see on stage as part of a full orchestra. But there are other instruments in those families that we haven't talked about that can be visitors on very special occasions. Take this guitar, for example. Now let me play something for you to see if you can guess which family of instruments this belongs to and how it makes a sound. That's right. The guitar is a string instrument. It has six strings, which are plucked using your fingers. Or a pick like this. The guitar is sometimes used in the orchestra, either as a part of the ensemble or as a solo instrument. When a musician plays a solo, they get to play a featured part all on their own. It's like being the star of the show. The soloist sits or stands front and center on stage, and the rest of the orchestra accompanies them. I love playing solos with an orchestra. It's so much fun. <laughs> to meet some more of the instruments that visit the orchestra, we have brought in a panel of experts. We are joined by four special guests, some of whom are members of the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. First up is Clayton. Hi, Toby. Thanks for having me. This is the alto saxophone. The alto saxophone is a woodwind instrument. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Clayton, that doesn't look like it's made of wood. And you're right, it's not. This is actually made of brass and you can see how shiny it is and how many keys it has on here too. Now, a one thing to really think about um, with the saxophone is that it is a woodwind instrument, not because of what it's made of, but because of 
the mouthpiece right here. The mouthpiece can sometimes be made of rubber or it can be made of steel. Another important part of the mouthpiece is this shiny part right here. This is called the ligature. Now the ligature can sometimes be made of metal like this. Sometimes it can be made of leather. I've also seen people use rubber bands and sometimes even string as a ligature. But the ligature's job is to hold on probably the most important part of the saxophone, the reed. Saxophone reeds are made of cane and they are cut down and they're made really thin up at the top right here. So when they put it, when you put it in your mouth, you blow into it and it vibrates like this. Now let me demonstrate for you what the mouthpiece sounds like. That's a really good goose call, but at the same time, it doesn't really sound very musical. Now what happens if we just use the neck? Nothing great, but let's put the two of them together. What do you know? That actually doesn't sound too too bad. Now what we do is we're going to put it on the body of the saxophone. Ta-da! And now with everything together, it sounds pretty good. What do you know? It sounds great. Now, the saxophone is a sometimes instrument in the orchestra, meaning that the saxophone will only sometimes be used. Why? Well, sometimes the saxophone is needed for a really important part, such as a solo or bringing in uh, a certain kind of sound that's needed that the composer needs. But a very large mainstay of the saxophone is jazz. Jazz is a very important part, uh, historically and culturally, of the saxophone. And there are some very good jazz excerpts out there, and I'm going to play you one right now. The saxophone's primary use in band is as a bridge between all of the brass instruments like trumpets and all of the woodwind instruments like clarinets. The reason why it's a bridge is because it's made out of both materials, brass and wood, such as on the mouthpiece. The saxophone's primary use in orchestra, however, is more so like a solo instrument, which can be a lot of fun to do. As a solo instrument, it's the saxophonist's job to make a point of the melody that the composer wrote and also act somewhat like a bridge, again, between the brass and the woodwind instruments. One of my favorite excerpts to play when I'm with an orchestra is Lars and Sweet by George Bizet. And there's a wonderful alto solo in it that I'm going to play for you right now. Sounding great. Now Clayton, we have a question for you from a student who lives in Georgia, Vermont. 
Hi, my name is Sam, and I live in Georgia, Vermont, and I'm nine years old. I have a question for you. How many different types of saxophones are there? That's a great question that you asked. The answer to that is there are four common types of saxophone that I have right here. The one that I'm holding right now is called the soprano saxophone. Now, soprano, you also notice this is silver, very shiny. The soprano saxophone are all straight one piece. They still have a reed up at the top and they are a higher sounding saxophone than the alto that I played already. The next common type of saxophone is the tenor saxophone. You can tell the difference between an alto and a tenor saxophone because the alto saxophone has a straight neck, while the tenor saxophone has a hump on its neck, kind of like a camel. This is what the tenor saxophone sounds like. The tenor saxophone is also very popular in jazz. Last, and certainly not least, is my favorite saxophone, the baritone saxophone. This one is the lowest and one of the biggest saxophones you can play. You can tell the difference between a baritone saxophone and the others because the baritone saxophone has a big loop in it. And this loop helps it play really low notes as well. The baritone saxophone also has a special key on it as well. This key right here closes all of the keys down here so that it can play one big low note. Thanks for explaining that, Clayton. And thank you, Sam, for that great question. Next up, we have our friend Heidi, who's super excited to share her instrument with all of you. Well, that sounds pretty good. Oh, hi, Toby. Hi, everybody. I'm Heidi. Welcome to my house. I've been tuning the harp. It's very important when you play the harp that you play it in tune. That's the most important thing, actually. So I always have one of these around. It's my tuning key. Actually, playing the harp is not all that difficult. You get to sit down, which is nice, right? You can relax. Oh. And you get behind the harp. I always put my head on this side. And you lean the harp back. And you hold it, right? You have to be careful you don't lean it too far back because it goes, oh, oh, it gets off balance. There is that special place where you, you learn where that is. And then you actually hold the harp with your knees. So that frees up your hands so that you can play on the strings. Okay? So now that I'm all balanced and comfortable, I take my fingers one at a time usually and I can play notes. I put energy in the string. I play with my right hand on this side and I play with my left hand on this side and I can play single notes. I could play two notes or with one hand I can play three notes or even four notes. Pretty good, huh? So you can play four notes with each hand. When we play the harp, we don't use our pinkies. People don't realize that, but that's okay, okay? So you can play eight notes at a time. Pretty good, huh? So I could play scales.
could play a scale like this. That's pretty fast, huh? Or I could play twos. Or, right? You just take one finger and you drag it on the string. You can go down or you can go up. Okay, I'm going to play something that I like to play with the orchestra. It's from Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet. And it's close to the end. And it's a big moment. Oh, everything's going to be fine at the end. Or so we thought. And then um, I get to play this. I listen. I count. One, two, three, four. And then I go. <laughs> you have all the other instruments around you and everybody's playing away and you get to play that I mean that's pretty exciting right okay now we can do some special effects on the harp usually we play in the middle of the string right that's where you get the most sound if you play lower on the string listen to how the sound changes you see it sounds like a little Play down close to the sounding board. Ooh, kind of interesting spooky music. We also can do what we call harmonics. You do this kind of funny little thing with your hand and you muffle the string in the middle while you play it at the same time. So that's a special effect. Sometimes people play with their fingernails. It sounds kind of funny. I know a piece where you have to do this. Let me see. This happens like this. Uh, like this. Another special effect that we do sometimes is just to tap on the sounding board. The harp is hollow in the middle here. The strings, when you play the string, it makes the string vibrate, and then that makes the sounding board vibrate, and then the body of the harp is empty. And it's like a sound chamber, and it sends that note amplifies it and if everything's right then you get a really really good sound okay I'm gonna play a little something that I like to play when I'm by myself and it is was written written originally for the guitar <laughs> Question for you from a student who lives in South Burlington, Vermont. Hi, my name is Sawyer. I'm five years old and I live in South Burlington, Vermont. And my question is how many strings does a harp have? Oh, that's a good question. I didn't tell you how many strings are on the harp. Um, this harp's name is Agnes. She's very old. She's what we call a parlor harp or a semi-grand harp. She's very beautiful. You see this? All the pretty gold and stuff on it. Um, this harp has 46 strings. This is good for playing at parties and weddings and things. 
Now, when I go and play with the orchestra, I always take that big black one, that one over there. That's called a concert grand harp. It has 47 strings on it. The last one, let me see. Let me play it, see what it sounds like. Can you hear that? So 46 or 47, so each string plays a different note. But then we have pedals down here, and the pedals work through a mechanism that goes through the base of the harp and up the column, this is called the column, and into the neck. And the neck is pretty cool, and it's got all this little, there's a rod in there that goes up and down, and there's a thing in here that looks like a bicycle chain, right? And you push the pedal, and it moves these little things. It's, I'm doing one pedal. I have seven pedals down here. Okay, there's lots of mysterious ones. This is what we call a glissando. And can you say that? Glissando. It's like ice skating, right? Gliding around. And I, and I think this is the one. So I put the pedals in different... Well, that sure is a cool instrument. Thank you for sharing your beautiful harp playing with us, Heidi. And now we're going to learn about another harp that looks very different from Heidi's. The instrument you see here is called the jaw harp. Many versions of this instrument exist all over the world, but this bamboo type has been played in Polynesia for a very long time. Polynesia is an area made up of over 1,000 islands located in the central and southern Pacific Ocean. The jaw harp is played by gently holding the instrument between your lips and plucking the reed to create a fantastic sound. You can alter the pitch and tone of the notes you play by using your tongue to change the amount of open space in your mouth or by using your breath. Because we hit the end of the jaw harp with our finger and we use our breath when we play it, it is considered both a wind and a percussion instrument. What a neat instrument with a unique sound. That seems like a lot of fun to play. And now we're going to turn it back over to a VSO musician to learn about our next visiting instrument, the piano. As you might know, the piano has lots of strings inside it, but it also has some hammers that strike those strings. So is the piano a string instrument or a percussion instrument? Is it part of two different families like the jaw harp? Let's hear from our friend Mary Jane to find out. Thanks, Mr. Toby. That is a great question. Um, I'm Mary Jane Austen. I love playing the piano, and it's really fun to play it in an orchestra. Um, this is what a piano sounds like. instrument for so many reasons but one is because you can play the melody and you can accompany yourself which is what I just did the melody is often in the right hand and this would be like a song that a singer would sing or a violinist would play and my left hand is playing the accompaniment which is what would go along with a singer or uh, a violinist or a, or a clarinetist or any other solo instrument. So piano, piano can do both, which is uh, really fun. So um, the piano is also kind of a cool instrument because it tries to be so many different things and I think it succeeds. So it's a string instrument because on the inside of the piano, as you can see, there are strings, okay? But 
it's also a percussion instrument because on the inside of the instrument, you might not be able to see this, but underneath the strings there are hammers that hit the strings. So, gosh, what is it? I don't know. String instrument, percussionist instrument? I'll tell you what. When I'm in the orchestra, usually the piano is situated in the back behind the strings, um, so behind the violins and the cellos, and so I don't really feel like I'm part of their group, but I'm right next to the percussionists, and we have a lot of fun because we love playing loudly and rhythmically, and that's um, one of the great things the piano can do. So in an orchestra, often the pianist starts playing when things get really exciting. So um, I need to tell you about the other parts of the piano. Um, underneath where my feet are, are the pedals. And you see there's a right pedal. And what that does is on the inside, these things here, they're called dampers. And they're stopping the sound from the strings so that the strings don't keep ringing. But when I press the pedal, what happens to the dampers? They go up. So that means that the sound will just continue until I lift my foot and it stops. So that's pretty fun. And But there are two other pedals. So there's another pedal on the left that will it's hard to see what it does, but maybe if you look at the keys, you can see something moving. There's also something moving inside. You might be able to see, okay, on the inside, the ha hammers underneath are moving side to side as I'm pressing the left pedal. And what that does is it moves it so that not all three strings, each note has three strings. So when the when the uh, I press this pedal, the the hammer doesn't hit all three strings anymore. It just hits one of them, and that makes the so sound softer. So here's without the soft pedal. Here's with the soft pedal. Big difference. Okay. So that's the mid the left pedal. Sorry. The next one is the middle pedal, and the middle pedal is if you want to hold down certain notes, look, the bomb, no hands, okay, and then I can play short notes other places. So it lets certain notes ring and ring and ring, and other ones can stay short if you need them to be, okay? Um, I hope that answers some of your questions about what a piano does. Now we have a question for you from a student who lives in South Burlington, Vermont. My question is, what's your favorite piece to play in the orchestra? Well, my favorite piece to play with an orchestra. That's a tough question, but I have to say that I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit and say that um, also because it's coming uh, up on that season, that I really love the Nutcracker. It is so much fun. But the instrument that I would be playing in the Nutcracker is actually not exactly this instrument. It's much smaller, and it's much higher pitched, and it sounds like bells. So that instrument's called the Celesta. And and there's a famous part of the Nutcracker that I think many of you will recognize. So I'm going to cheat and play it on the piano because I don't have a Celesta. In fact, not too many people do. Um, but this is, I'm going to play it up an octave from where I would normally play on the piano to make it sound like a Celesta. So here's a little bit from that.
you so much for sharing your favorite music with all of us, Mary Jane. And now we're going to hear from our final musician. She might look a little familiar to those of you who watched our brass episode. Our friend Sheila, the French horn player, is here with us again. This time, she's going to talk to us about an instrument called the Wagner tuba. What's a French horn player doing playing a tuba? Let's find out. Hi everyone. I'm so glad to spend a little bit of time today talking about one of the coolest misfits of the symphony orchestra, the Wagner tuba. Now the Wagner tuba was invented and introduced into the symphony orchestra in the early 1850s. It was invented by romantic composer Richard Wagner. Now it would be impossible to talk about the Wagner tuba without talking a little bit about Wagner himself. So we're going to do that. Wagner was born in 1813 and died in 1883. He was a really important composer and there are a lot of reasons for that. <clears throat> More reasons than we're going to go into today. But to begin with the instrument, Wagner was special and very important because he heard sounds in a very different and unique way compared to all of the composers that came before him. He heard sounds and envisioned works of music so specifically that when it came time to write one of the most important works of his life, which we call the Ring Cycle, which is a series of four operas, he was not willing to settle for the many instruments that existed during his time. He wasn't willing to write for the horn and try and get the French horn to sound the way he wanted it to sound. Instead, he talked to craftsmen and instrument makers of his time and talked about developing brand new instruments that could create what he heard. Now, what did he hear specifically with the Wagner tuba in mind? He heard a combination of the French horn and the trombone. So if you were going to cross-pollinate a trombone and a French horn, this is what you would get. The Wagner tuba is the result of that vision. So knowing what we know about the trombone and the horn, we can make some guesses right off the bat about how the Wagner tube is gonna sound. And we can also make some guesses based on how it looks and its size. We know that it's not going to be high and bright like the trumpet. It's going to be mellow. It's going to have a, a smooth sound and it's not going to be very strident. But compared to the trombone and the French horn, there is an openness, there is a width to the sound of the Wagner tuba that I think you're going to hear right away. It really is its very own thing. <laughs> between a French horn and a trombone, just like Wagner wanted. Pretty cool, right? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to play an orchestral excerpt on the Wagner tuba, and then I'm gonna play it on the French horn so that you can compare what the two instruments sound like, how they're different, and how they're similar. I'm gonna play one of the promenades from Mussorgsky Ravel's Pictures at an Exhibition. <laughs> on the Fogner tuba. Okay, so here's the horn for comparison. And incidentally, this excerpt was originally written for horn, not Fogner tuba, just to be super clear about that. I thought it would be a really good example to compare because this excerpt is written for the middle to the low register of the horn. Or 
the main difference is that the sound of the horn has a little bit more center to it, a little bit more of a core. And that's no accident. That's essentially what Wagner had in mind. And it's good because that's what he got. Thanks so much for teaching us about the Wagner tuba, Sheila. Now we have a very special guest we'd like you all to meet. This is a piano student who's going to tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a young musician. Hi, thank you for joining us. What's your name and how old are you? My name is William and I am nine years old. Could you please show us your instrument and tell everyone how long you've been playing? Um, well, this is my piano. Um, uh, I've been playing for about two years. Are there any accessories that you use for your instrument or anything that you have at home that you need for practicing and playing? Well, um, I use my piano book and my metronome. Well, that's great. Why did you pick your instrument? And where do you play and learn your instrument currently? Well, the reason I picked my instrument, really my mom just chose to sign me up for piano lessons. And I play in the living room of my house. Wow, you must be really good. I've heard you've been practicing a piece you'd like to share with us. Could you please tell us what it is and play it for us? It's called On Top of Wood Smoky, and I will play it. Amazing! Hey everyone at home, can you clap and cheer with me once more for that wonderful performance? You must really love playing and practice a lot to get so good. Can you tell everyone why you love making music? Well, the reason why I like it is because I like the way the piano sounds and um, I like, it gives me the right kind of challenge, and I also like trying to figure out songs that I've heard before in different places. Would you encourage other kids to try it? Yes, I would. We really appreciate your willingness to share your music with all of us. And for those of you that don't have an instrument at home, but would like to try playing one, pay very special attention to this next segment, where I'm going to show you how to make your very own straw saxophone. Once again, you're going to need a straw and scissors. Now don't worry if you don't have those things on hand right now. We'll post a recipe on the VSO website for later. And now I'm gonna show all of you how to make your very own straw saxophone. But before we begin, make sure that your hands and scissors are clean. The first step is you're gonna take your straw, just like this, and stretch out the end. Next step is you're going to take the very tip and flatten it out with your teeth, like this. And once the tip is extra flat here, we're gonna make our mouthpiece. So we're gonna take our scissors and very carefully cut the shape of a V, like this. And there we have our mouthpiece for our straw saxophone. The final step is we're going to make three holes along the body of the straw saxophone. And in order to do this, you're going to take your fingers and make a little pinch just like this. And once you've made your pinch, you're going to take your scissors and cut the shape of a V again in order to make a small little hole. There we have one hole. And a second one. 
And there is our final hole. And there we have it, everybody. Your very own straw saxophone. <laughs> Now that's just about it for today's Musical Chairs, presented by Vermont Symphony Orchestra's Symphony Kids. I'd like to say a big thank you today to our special guest performers, to our young student musician, to the Birds of Vermont Museum, and to all of you for tuning in. This is our final episode of Musical Chairs, and if you haven't already, feel free to check out our previous episodes to learn about the rest of the instruments of the orchestra. Orchestral music can be so much fun, and we want you to know that you Yes, you can be a part of it. We say goodbye today with an arrangement of Vermont's state song, These Green Mountains, performed by today's guest musicians, Clayton, Heidi, Tom, and Sheila. We encourage you to sing along at home. Bye-bye. <laughs>